Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Faculty Spotlight. This is Dr. Amy Smith, and she will be speaking on Making Time for Time, How We Reason About Duration. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Amy Smith. You come from the uh, Department of Education uh, here at Stetson, and you are an assistant professor, as I understand it. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, so we can talk about many other things. I know some of our back conversations today have been highly interesting about math, but the um, area of my current research has been really focused on how young children reason about duration. And so I have a PowerPoint. Let's make sure everyone can see that. Um, Perfect. So what my favorite question to ask every person that I meet, no matter what age they are, is, is what is time? And so I'm kind of curious what you all might say. So if you had to tell me what is time, what would you say? Well, Amy, I would say, uh, I believe Einstein said time is relative to speed. Uh, I don't think that's correct. I think time is relative to age uh, because as I get older, time seems to go a lot faster. <laughs> so, uh, so I have my own theory of relativity there that it's not relative to time. It's uh, relative to speed. It's relative to time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, our brain damaged brain can't say it right. But. <laughs> awesome. I see in the chat we have is a system of measurement, which is a very scientific way of thinking about time. I think it's the same 24 hours I have every day. So time is the 24 hours of your day. And everybody has the same 24 hours, but it's how we spend them. Interesting. So we all have this set quantity and how we utilize that is the part that might matter. Um, so, the study of time has been going on since the dawn of thought, really. Um, Aristotle, back in 300 BCE, used to discuss time, and his definition was similar to some of yours, which is, it's this idea of a number of change. So, Glenn, you brought up this idea of kind of how we move through and it changes over time, you know, that time changes over time. So, Aristotle had this establish time as a number, as a quantity of our life. Um, Descartes later said it was a number of motion, which brought in that idea of speed and how we go through our time. And then later Hume brought in that time is about our perception, which I think um, was brought up also. It's this idea of what we perceive in those 24 usable hours of our day really changes. Um, Einstein is a big one talking about time being relative his was much more in the scientific sense of relative to your position in space, um, thinking about it as that fourth dimensionality kind of space. Um, and then much later, Piaget, who is um, an educational researcher, he defined time in the same context of defining space. Um, and he said, time cannot be perceived nor conceived apart from the events that fill it, which I also think our last respondent kind of hit on this idea of time matters in as much as the things that we do during that quantity is important. Um, one thing I wanna highlight is all of our perspectives today and all the ones I um, just mentioned are very much a Western perspective. This comes from a very Western point of view and in other cultures, time is a very different, um, different domain. So much of my research, obviously coming from the Western perspective is going to be focused on kind of that same space. Um, so time, a lot of the answers I get from people, time is clocks or time is the numbers on the clock. Um, we brought this up, <laughs> Glenn, you brought this up really nicely. It's about how you live and how you proceed through your own experiences. And time feels different when we're 10 versus when we're 50. It definitely has a different feeling for us. Um, a lot of adults, when I ask them about time, talk specifically about management and scheduling and planning and organizing. And, you know, I think Betty, you hit on it. It's this idea of it's how we use our day, but that becomes much more important the older we get. Um, and then this kind of more theoretical 
time and perception and relativity and space time continuum kind of thing. It does come up a lot of times from science people. They like to bring that in. So when I started my research on this about seven years ago, the first thing I did was I asked kids the same question. So I asked them very forwardly, what is time? And so a kindergartner answered very bluntly, time is when you wait. So it was purely about his experience of waiting. A first grader kind of hesitated. He didn't Im immediately respond. And he looked around and under his breath said, I don't know. So I asked if he had ever heard that word before. And he said, well, like when dinosaurs used to be alive, which I found really interesting that to this kiddo, time was not about the now, it was about the past. And so he was very much pulling himself away from versus the kindergartner where it was his experience, this first grader, it didn't seem to be experiential for him at all. Um, oops, sorry, wrong button. My second grader is kind of giggled and worked through time is like, it's like if it's three o'clock to 10 o'clock and my mom says 50 more minutes, I can play, then I go to sleep and then it'll be like four o'clock. So the second grader brought in for the first time, this idea of kind of standard units, which correlates very much with when we teach time. So time is first introduced in late first grade, early second grade in American schools. And so it makes sense that we would see between first grade and second grade, this uptick of the use of standard units and measure um, hours, clocks, those types of things. The third grader, similar to the second grader and the first grader had a lot of hesitation. So there was this lot of like, mm, I don't know, it's, uh, mm, I can't. And then finally came out, time is how you know what time of day it is or nighttime. So this idea though about time being how we organize the day and night, how we know where we are in the position of the events of the day. Um, a fourth grader really threw me off and I loved it so much. So the fourth grader said, um, it's a state of travel, which I was like, oh, where did this response come from? Um, so I asked him what he meant and then his response changed a lot in tone. Time is a way to structure minutes, seconds, hours, days, months, years, and so on. So I think this kiddo probably has studied Einstein, I would say, or some kind of relativity of time and knows this idea of time being about our positionality in space. But then when I asked him to elaborate, it became much more about the things that they learn in school, hours, minutes, seconds. But I like that he added in, it's about the structure of them. So we're kind of formalizing it a little bit. The fifth grader started by kind of questioning like time, why are you asking me that? Um, but then they brought in, well, there's a clock. Every second can't be relived, which is something that adults have brought out before, including some of you. Um, you can't live the same second, the same minute, same hour, same day. You can't relive it. And then this fifth grader added on, sometimes I think people stress about time, which I thought was an interesting turn. There's this idea of time being precious. So it's this quantity that, you know, in kindergarten, it seems to be about the immediate. And then over time, it becomes more about formalized operations. But in fifth grade, they started bringing in this idea that it is important and relative to people's lives. And it does really matter. So this was my first jump into um, kind of my background research. So I spent the first 13 years of my career teaching elementary school. Um, I taught second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. So I had a lot of exposure to how time is taught versus how time is learned. And when we consider formal school instruction, time is taught only in two ways, how to read the clock and how to use standard units. There is nothing before that that might help students understand what it is that the clock is measuring or what it is that these standard units are measuring. It's just, here's this tool, learn how to use it, here are these units, learn how to operate with them. So there's kind of this disconnect, I think, between what students should understand and what we're teaching initially. Um, 
when you think about though, where kids learn about time, most often it's coming from their everyday experiences. And this is where I think me really highlighting my Western perspective is very, it matters. Because time is so cultural and because how I use time with my own family is very different than how some of you probably use time with your family. My children have different understandings about time than your children. And so thinking about these experiences and what it is that they're discussing when we say, hey, you have five more minutes until it's time for bed, or hey, don't forget we have soccer practice at five. The thing that we're talking about is duration. And so there is a bit of a difference we're not actually talking about what is time. Time is a human construct. Duration is the thing that time is attempting to measure. And so from thinking about this idea that there's a disconnect between what is taught and how students learn about time, the big question that kind of initiated all of my research is what assumptions are being made about the informal durational experience experiences when we are teaching formal time instruction. So we have to assume kids are coming in with something. So what are we assuming? And when I started looking into my research, I found that there really wasn't anything. All of the existing research that was out there on children's learning of time was restricted to operating with clocks and watches or very prescribed experiments where it's like, we're going to listen to two pieces of music, you tell me which is longer. So instead of really thinking about it through their lives and their own experiences, it was very prescribed experimental context. So I've been working for the past few years to develop some bank of, of knowledge about what is it that kids think about time before they ever are introduced to any formalized time instruction in school. So I've been working with four, five, and six-year-olds. That's been my primary area of research. I didn't go younger than four because it's very challenging for them to elaborate on their ideas and to think through their own experiences and reflect. It's very challenging. I tried not to go past six, uh, six years old though because that's the end of kindergarten. And then after that point, they're starting first grade and they're starting to learn about those formal time operations. So my research that I've been doing, I found three existing um, themes that kids tended to think about time. So the first thing was time is an accumulation of activities. So it can either be a repeated activity that happens multiple times. For example, this thing took a long time because I did it and then I had to redo it and I had to redo it again. So this idea of a repeated activity is what caused it to be a long time. Um, some other kiddos describe time though through a series of unique activities. So, well, I know it doesn't take very long to brush my teeth because all I have to do is put toothpaste on, brush my teeth and spit and I'm done. So this idea of it's just these three things, there's not a lot to do. So this was a very common way that little kids spoke about time through their actual experiences. Um, I really found this theme prominent in my past research because one argument that was made in Piaget's research was that kids are incapable of creating spontaneous durational units. I disagree with that. I think these kiddos are starting the unitizing operation. They're starting to think about chunks of their life in terms of long or short, which means they're starting to quantify experiences of their lives in a durational way. So I think that this is a really important starting place. And it's the one theme that I have found every one of my participants that I've ever interviewed has talked about this. So I think it's going to be a really powerful one for me moving forward. Um, another way that I had found in my past research that kiddos talked about time was through a consideration of gross quantity. So like I had to build a Lego. There were a lot of pieces, so it took a long time. So this idea of a lot of pieces, a long time, that correlation and that development of number comes up quite often. Um, I found the gross quantity, they were considering either the amount of objects, 
they were considering the size of objects or they were considering the distance of objects. So like, oh, when we go to this place, it takes longer because it's farther away. So those types of discussions, can, you know, connecting directly the quantity to the duration. And that was um, an extension of Piaget's concept of number is where I connected it out. And then the last one is something that actually it makes it makes the gross quantity a little harder. So gross quantity makes sense. If I have more pieces, it's going to take more time. The last way I saw that some kiddos were reasoning about time was if I put in more effort, so more going up, it will take me less time. So there was this inverse operation happening with some kiddos when they were thinking about the exertion that they put in. So that might be um, how fast they were moving. If I moved faster, it took less time, or that might be their effort. Because it took me less effort, it took me more time, or because it was easier, it took me less time. So those types of inverse relationships came up. They most often come up though, through the older participants. So I see this most often in my six-year-olds where they're starting to reason about this inverse relationship of effort and duration. So this is what I had come into my new research that I did with. I came in with these three pieces of, of knowledge. And um, the goal, oh, sorry, I'm missing something. This is not right. I'm missing a slide. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, hey, I will work through that one. So the goal of this current research for me was I really wanted to use this opportunity from my Stetson Summer Grant that I was so grateful to have to try to gather a bigger bank of knowledge. So knowing that these things are so cultural, I had only conducted my study in one location with one group of children. And so being able to have access to more children from a different location to see were the themes the same? Was there anything that crossed regions that I could say, maybe this is more common than just these isolated children? Um, having the opportunity to talk to more kids obviously also expanded some of my current uh, themes that I was able to find. So the first thing that this research from this last summer did was it validated all three of my existing themes. So I found all three themes in my students from this summer. From Sorry, not my students, my kiddos. Um, so for example, one kiddo this summer was talking about working on math homework. And I said, can you think of something that takes you longer to do? And he hesitated for a while and then he said, spray paint. And I said, okay, why does that take you longer? And he said, it's hard to do. So there's this idea of exertion. It, it's harder energy, so it's taking longer. And then he went on to say, you have to do the bottom, you have to do the back, you have to do the front. And so this idea of the accumulating activities, there are multiple sides and steps that have to be done, which makes it take longer. Um, I also got validation of my gross quantity. So asking kiddos, you know, can you think of something that takes longer? Building Legos because they're big and there are a lot of pieces. That idea of things that have more pieces are going to take longer. Um, one kiddo talked about that going to the park didn't take very long because it's not that far from our house. So distance, it's a close distance. So it didn't take very long. So all of my existing themes got validated by all of the participants that I was able to interview um, during my summer grant, which was great. I was really, i um, excited to see that the things that I had found weren't isolated incidents, that there are at least some validations to what I had seen before. This summer, though, I was so lucky with the participants that I gathered, I was able to expand upon the themes that I had. So I pulled a few new themes out. Um, some of my kiddos that I interviewed this summer, and it was three of them, talked about Things are easier or harder depending on the support I get during them. And so how long do you think it'll take to build a sandcastle is what I asked this kiddo. And he said, well, it depends on who helps me. And I said, oh, how come? 
And he said, well, if I do it on my own, it won't take so long. And so I asked, well, what if your sister helped? And he said, oh, she doesn't know how to make a sandcastle. So I said, oh, will that make it take longer or shorter? And he said, longer. And I said, well, longer than with you? Yep. And I said, well, what if your brother helped you? And the kid said, oh, well, he's made sandcastles before. So I said, well, would it be faster or slower? And he said, faster. So this idea of different people assisting me can actually impact the duration of my experiences. This is something I had never seen before in my past research. So I was really excited about how this might fit into um, kind of that cultural learning theory area. I also had some kiddos this summer talk about their perceived competence with certain events. And so this kiddo was talking about swimming and how it takes different amounts of time to swim different lengths across the pool. And one stroke, the backstroke took longer. And the kiddo said, well, because I'm not as good at it. So this idea of because I'm not as good, my competence with it is lower. So the duration will be longer. Um, I thought that was really cool. This kiddo in particular was very interesting because he also had a watch. And he, everything I mentioned to him, talked about my watch told me. And I've never had another participant, which is where I think really thinking about the culture that this is taking place in, none of my other participants mentioned watches. But this kiddo, I mean, the whole interview, he was showing me his watch and he was very proud of his watch. Um, but all of his durations, the watches what helped him know how long they took. So that was a new thing that I hadn't seen before. Um, and so I was interested in where that might go. And I kind of want to touch back base with this little one to see how it might develop his sense of time as he moves forward. So beyond getting validation of these two themes, which I kind of clump under the exertion theme that I had already had, I got some new themes that I had never seen before. And so I had a little girl talk about eating Brussels sprouts and she let me know that it took a really long time to eat Brussels sprouts because she didn't like them very much. But when she eats French toast, it doesn't take as long because she loves them. So this idea of enjoyment, if I like something, it's going to take shorter time because I like it. And if, it, if I don't like it, it's going to take longer time. So there's this idea of enjoyment that Piaget briefly mentioned in his um, children's conceptions of time text, but he didn't elaborate on it very much. So I was excited to see it come up in my research. Um, another kiddo talked about things taking more or less time because of how often he does them or how repetitive it is. And so like waiting at Starbucks took a long time, but the reason he said it took a long time was because he does it every day. So like the novelty is worn off, which I think connects back to Glenn, your idea of when we're younger, everything is novel, everything is new and life moves so fast. And as we get older, things get a little more repetitive and things feel differently. And life day to day, we can understand and take things in in a different way. So to this little boy, the longness came because it was something that wasn't new and exciting to him. So something kind of interesting that I hadn't seen in previous research. Um, so with the summer research I was able to do, I was able to validate all of my existing themes, my accumulating activities, gross quantity and exertion. I was able to extend my exertion and add an additional theme which was the idea of enjoyment or novelty of a task. So I, this research really helped develop some, a broader bank of knowledge, which is what I was hoping to do from it. So the thing that I get asked about a lot, which I think goes back to what we were discussing before my presentation began, is why does this matter? Um, math is a tricky area for why things matter because we don't necessarily need to know how long something takes if we can just punch a timer in on our clock. And we can just take our phone and say, hey, Siri, set the timer for 20 minutes. I don't now have to think about what that 20 minutes means because Siri will let me know when that time is up. Um, I've also been asked by a lot of people, why do we even need to teach analog clocks anymore? They're antiquated. Everyone's got a cell phone. Everyone's got access to digital clocks. So what's the point of it? Um, 
I think durational reading uh, reasoning matters a great deal. Oh my gosh. Did it not even show? My goodness. I'm so sorry. This is terrible with me. I'm going to stop my share. You um, can you pop it up and just pop to my last slide? I don't know why it yeah. didn't show. Give me a few seconds here to set everything up. Gotta love technology. <laughs> is it showing or no? I don't see it. Hang on one second. You're good. Share screen first. <laughs> Perfect. You're awesome. That works. Yep. Um, so time is part of so much of our life. And you can click one more time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so in terms of I'm talking to four, five, and six year olds, I'm talking to kiddos before they have any formal instruction in time. But as they move through school, time pops up over and over again. In middle school, it's there when they're learning about rate and velocity. In science, when they start talking about physics, time is always the assumed independent variable. They, it's, it's so assumed that a lot of times people don't even look at the label of the axis. They just assume that that horizontal axis is going to be some version of time. Um, when we're reason, reasoning covariationally, when we're thinking about how do things change? We always assume the changes in relation to time. And so if students believe that time could only exist in the past or that time changes from one person to the next, that my 20 minutes is not the same as your 20 minutes, how are they thinking about these relationships happening when they get to calculus and are trying to reason covariationally? What are they doing to reason about these different you know, quantities of the world. The bigger one though, that I think is really gonna become a huge issue is there has been some studies recently from um, a researcher out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, his name is Daryl Ernst, Ernest, and he's looking at college students' ability to time manage and how that might be impacting, impacting their success of graduating from college. And he noticed that a lot of the students that were coming to the Success Center were students who, you know, could not figure out how to put a schedule together. They could not figure out how to plan their day out. And they were at risk of failing out of college because they didn't have those executive functioning skills, those time management skills. And when you think about, you know, the little kids, if they don't understand that Yes, five minutes might feel differently if I'm playing at the park versus if I'm reading a book versus if I'm vacuuming the floor. That five minutes might feel differently, but for the sake of planning, that five minutes is a standardized thing that we need to understand what it is and how to utilize it. And I think that is something that I know, like for my own students, I see their time management skills and I see some potential issues with that. And I think, well, what do you think about duration? How are you reasoning about the time that you have available in your life? Um, so I think if we can start understanding what it is that the littles think about time from birth and then follow that up and say, time instruction shouldn't stop in third grade because they've learned how to read a clock. That's not, that should not be the end of time instruction. Time instruction, should change into durational reasoning and start working on some of those planning skills and start working on some of those reasonings that might impact their ability to become functioning members of the world we live in. Because unfortunately, American society in particular is very time conscious. It's very dependent on the clock. When you're late, you get punished. If you're too early, you get looked at oddly. And so thinking about that might have big implications for some of these kiddos moving forward. So you can click to the next slide. I always end with my favorite joke. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's where my research is. And I was so grateful um, to the Office of Provost and Academic Affairs to have the opportunity to continue my research this summer. Um, I am working right now to try to build a more complete bank of knowledge about this. 
Um, I'm trying to house it under the uh, learning theory of funds of knowledge, and I'm trying to develop a funds of durational knowledge mm -hmm. and how that might impact um, kiddos and be looked at and considered when we're thinking about what we teach kids. So that's where I'm at. If you have any questions or comments or thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Very enlightening. I will never think about time, except I'm like Glenn. The sand's running out of the hourglass. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard to explain to a kiddo too. Like, why is it that time is so yeah, important? Yeah. Why does it matter so much? And yeah. And it's, and it's interesting, the idea that when you're having fun, it's fast. And when you're not having fun, it I mean, that's really interesting as well, Amy. Yeah. And there was, it's funny, the only research on that at all, I found one language study. And that's something that I didn't bring up. There's there are quite a few studies on durational reasoning through a linguistics mm -hmm. perspective where they're looking at how, like the language of time. Right. And if, if we say, hey, just a minute, we don't literally mean a minute. Right. We mean, right. hold on a second, which again, we don't really mean a second. second. <laughs> it's yeah. so hard. Um, but yeah, so I found one study that talked about um, the idea of like time flying by. So like if you're sitting in a car and you're bored, you get yeah. pro protracted durations or you get compressed durations and those types of, yeah, it can really change. But again, it's not a different amount of time. It just right. Right. feels that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I always loved um, Mark Hollis, uh, who of course funds all the stuff that we do, yep. um, who said, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. He used to always say that. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. It's how we spend it. And the other thing he said is we could you control your attitude. So I, I think that the time factor, I think about that a lot. And I talk about that a lot with my FSM students because their time management is is bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we do a 24-7 time log mm -hmm. to see where their time's going. But um, it is it is interesting um, how uh, our perception of time is so unique to our situation and different variables. Thanks, Amy, that was great. You're welcome. Yep. Thank you, Amy. It was interesting, yeah. very interesting. I wonder if um, if you'd have different findings for different age groups. Uh, so my initial research, I was doing preschool through fifth grade. That was my first group. And the problem that I bumped up against, which is why my research came so much, was the second they have that formal time instruction, they refuse to talk about anything but clocks. And even like I was doing like what I felt was my best possible prompting and my best <laughs> possible, like let's, let's try to go a different direction and talk about it in a different way. And they always went back to, well, my watch would say this, or oh, I know it's yeah. five minutes. And I would ask, how did you know it was five yeah. minutes? Well, cause I know. And I'm like, how could you prove to me that it was five minutes? And then they're like, well, you would look at a watch. And I'm like, hmm. So I, that was why I actually modified it to go down a little uh -huh. bit um, and just start looking at what are they even thinking about before? And then I'm working with Daryl Ernest to try to build a more comp like logical and comprehensive progression of durational reasoning that would start preschool and track up with kids all the way through to attempt to mm -hmm. get them to recognize that duration and time are actually mm -hmm. two different things. Because that was another problem. I can't ask a kid, tell me about duration. That means nothing. To right, me. right, right. Tell me about time. Now they're bringing me the things they know. So even the language, and that's where the linguistic side of it is also equally mm -hmm. challenging. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum, right, as you were saying, that really needs to be attacked or examined and revised. It, yeah. yeah it, well, and if you look, I mean, I know nobody's looked at the, the standards as much as I have for this particular topic. Um, it's literally first, second, and third grade. And it's only about clock reading. Mm -hmm. And then in fourth grade, in fifth grade, they mention it as part of another standard, but it's talking about 
um, elapsed time calculation. Yeah. So it's more about just the calculating, but none of the standards, like this is where I really struggle. If you think of other units of measure in preschool and kindergarten and first grade, we teach them what it is to measure something. So we're teaching them like, if I wanna know how long something is, how could I figure that out? And they, they're putting down, you know, the little teddy bear manipulatives to try to figure out, well, how many teddy bears is it? And then what if I measured it in paper clips? Oh, right. well, it's more paper, paper clips, clips than teddy bear, right? Like there's mm -hmm. this progression that allows them to understand what it is to measure. Mm -hmm. It's never attached to time. I think because time is abstract. You can't physically lay a length of time against another length of time to measure it that way, which makes it much more challenging from the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, no, how to teach it is I think a whole other, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But that's what makes it so interesting too, right? To, to, to get into their little minds. Yeah. It does. When it, it pops up later, I, you know, I mentioned in my dissertation and I kind of got in trouble from my, um, my committee a little bit because they were like, mm, you're kind of criticizing this person. And I was like, I, I don't ever mention this person by name and I'm not trying to criticize, but I was at a baby shower once, which if you've ever been to a baby shower, they're, you know, they can be long experiences of <laughs> not the most exciting. And we were standing around talking and this woman looked over at a clock on the wall and I'll, I will give credit though. It was an analog clock mm -hmm. and the wall was kind of at an angle. So you were looking at it like off a, a steep mm -hmm. angle, but she looks at the clock and goes, Oh my goodness. It's already two o'clock. I have to get going. And I look at my phone and it was 1210. So the hands <laughs> were in the same yeah. arrangement. But she thought it was two o'clock. <laughs> and and what concerned me was not that she misread the clock because we've all we've all made right. those kind of you know computational mistakes don't bother me in the slightest because that's just normal. What really stuck to me though was the fact that she couldn't reason about 10 minutes of duration because it started at noon versus two <laughs> hours of duration. Like she didn't recognize there's no way that I've been here for two hours. It was really boring, Amy. I, I just like, I was like, I don't understand. So yeah. that was one of those events where I was like, this matters. Like to this woman, she could not reason durationally about her own experiences in any way that made sense. So I think that, you know, I really think we all have stories about times in our lives where time didn't, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. didn't fit right. And it happens to everybody. And I'm just so curious, well, why are we not talking about it more? Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's part of our lives, why don't we do anything with it? So, are you certain that wasn't her way of trying to get out? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, <laughs> two o'clock, wow, <laughs> gotta go. Gotta go. And I'm out of here before anybody questions me on the time. <laughs> I would never say that about that month. No. Uh, yeah, and you know, and that's the funny thing also, like, I, you know, I, I wanted to write an article. I have yet to do it called the mom minute and all mothers and fathers, it, you know, it's so gender biased of me to say mom minute. I'm doing it from my own experience. But when my son was little, I would say we'd be at the park and I'd be like, okay, you have five more minutes. And then if it started raining or if it was getting really hot, or if I just did not want to be there anymore, I'd be like, oh, time to go. And it was like a minute and a half later. Right. Or somebody would come up and I would get to talking with them and it would be 20 minutes later and my, you know, my, be like, okay, time to go. My poor son's understanding of what five minutes means. Changed. How yeah. skewed is it? Because five minutes was totally subjective on my needs as a parent. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, like, how do parents talk to their own children? about time and duration and what are we doing to create a, an understanding of these units that they are supposed to go operate with later but we've given them kind of a skewed beginning and i am guiltier than everybody on that so i don't know i just think the implications for this are really vast my kids call that my bluff on time when i say like, okay uh, 10 minutes and then we'll do that they go straight to the Google home and say, okay, Google, set a timer for 10 oh. minutes. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so it's something that they're very much like, that's 10 minutes. And mm -hmm. after that 10 minutes, you need to explain to me why, dad, you are taking longer than 10 minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I love it. I love that they're calling you out on it, though. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah. that's that's because it's mostly my wife. It's she runs the Miami <laughs> time, so. <laughs> 15 minutes is, you know. So. Well, and, and that, I love that you brought that up, Chris, because that's actually why I wanted to do more research in different locations, because there's a great book called The Geography of Time, um, and he did, he went to 50 major cities in the U.S., and then, like, 50 different countries, and he sat and just watched how people reasoned about time, mm. and how you, I mean, I just moved to Florida last year. How we deal with time in Florida is very different than what I am used to. And yeah. I was so interested to see what I will say. I haven't delved into my summer research quite as much as obviously my dissertation research, but there, I didn't notice any big differences culturally. Like it wasn't like the kiddos down here talked more about longer durations or talked more about not knowing they really talked about it in the same way. So I wonder where that, you know, summertime or Florida time kind of idea comes from because it's, I, it, it doesn't show up in the kids. I don't know. Amy, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It, it, it struck me that early you said that um, time really is more of a human invention and we've invented it to be useful for us. Uh -huh. uh, and we value different things. So uh, a person, the, the precision of time, I think is is much more valued to running a railroad than say, you know, enjoying the uh, the park. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a human invention to um, meet human goals or to advance human goals, and it's important in science because you're measuring things and time is a Precision is important when you measure things. Um, I seem to recall from my history, Chris, and you may correct me if I'm wrong, but that um, it was either latitude or longitude, and I think it was longitude, that you couldn't really tell where you were unless you had an accurate timepiece. And so it became important to know uh, for navigational reasons. Um, and then it, uh, but uh, whether it was noon in Philadelphia, noon in Boston, it didn't matter when you didn't have any way of communicating with Boston that noon. <laughs> you, uh, it was just when the sun was directly overhead. So noon, it really, I think, standardization became more of a, fe a feature when it was railroads mm -hmm. because we then, and so our Western culture puts an emphasis on finite units mm -hmm. uh, more so, I think, than historically we have been accustomed to. And uh, my sister-in-law lives in South Africa and has for 20 years. They have, uh, I'm leaving now. And then they have, I'm leaving just now. And then I'm leaving now, now. And all of those things, it's, a, it's really sort of a block. You know, now I'm leaving now means I'm leaving soon. But, you know, Mary, I'll, I'll ask Mary, when are you coming back soon? And we said, well, that doesn't really tell me very much. <laughs> you know? So I wonder if we impose when we do the, the clocks, if we're imposing on students something, children, something that's valuable to us as adults, but not particularly valuable to them. And that we may be, uh, we may be entering a time when, we may be entering a time, I can't get over it, we may be entering an age where time is a the precision of time is a little less important uh, because there are uh, any number of ways to. Uh, I think about my own. Uh, I'm interested in agrarian life from a hundred years ago, because hundred years ago wasn't different than two that much different than two hundred years ago. But a hundred years ago today, it's very different. And the uh, the agrarians didn't really have any need for clocks. You know, it, you you moved according to when it was light and when it was dark, you went to bed. You know, so imposing a a, a restriction um, that it strikes me as it's it's not necessarily a concept that a child would naturally that a human would naturally have, and we're imposing a you you call it a skill. You know, we're imposing a skill because it, we, we adults find that a useful skill. But uh, Chris, your children don't find it a particularly useful skill you know, because their world is different. Perfect example of that is um, 
my son, when I'm putting him to bed, I say, it's bedtime. It's eight o'clock. Well, he's like, the light's still out. Oh, it's not dark yet. It's, we don't need yeah. to go to sleep yet. And I'm like, no, it's, it's time because we have to wake up at this time. Very much yeah. specifically what you're talking about is that's the perfect example of it. Because my yeah. son looks outside the window and says, nope, it's not time for bed. It's still bright out. Yeah. So He's listening to much more natural clues. I've been recently interested in Aboriginal practice in Australia. <laughs> of all things. And this notion of time is really, um, I think they have a more enlightened view of time mm -hmm. because they don't, they see us as being, or the Aboriginal cultures that I've been looking at, see us more as a, a part of a continuum as, as opposed to, it's not finite the way we think of time. We honestly think of time as finite. And um, and so we impose finite ways of talking about time when time really is not it's not finite probably. I mean, you know, if you think of I don't know, I would be interested in more when our brains are when our in human development, when our brains are prepared to accept a concept that is not necessarily one that naturally occurs to us. And that Go ahead. You, you look, you have a response. And I don't want to. Oh, I, I, I love everything that you're talking about. So when I started my research, I actually started with clocks because I was much more in the teacher frame of why are clocks so hard to teach kids? That was kind of the initial, like, we all know kids can't read clocks. Why is this so hard? And so I did a bunch of research on like the history of clocks and where they came from. And like, going back to in ancient Egypt, they would make tea clocks, which were based on the shadows and they, they would use them so that their slaves knew when they were allowed to come in. And so they had marked certain lines on the tea clock so that they, the slaves knew that they were allowed to come back in and that was their rest time. And then as you know, a different part of the world, um, Christians used clocks as a, like the bell on a clock as a way to tell people it was time for prayer, it was time for church, it was time. So it became much more a tool for, um, you know, different hierarchy systems to impose the structure they wanted onto yeah. other people. Yeah. When I slid and moved away from clocks and back into this idea of just durational understandings in general, I do still think kiddos develop their durational understandings and their concept of duration as an attribute of their lives, whatever that attribute might be, based on the systems that they are growing up in. And so, you know, like, you know, Chris talking about, well, it's not time to go to bed because the sun isn't down. You're establishing this understanding that bedtime is not a result of how you feel. It is not a result of what it looks like outside. It is the result of this tool. And other cultures, that's not how they work, right? Like theirs is when my body is tired, I go to bed. It doesn't matter what time, what it looks like outside. When my body is tired, I go to bed. And other cultures, it's when the sun goes down, I go to bed. So every culture is establishing for their children what these understandings of duration are. And they're bringing that up then with them. And I think you know, Glenn, I feel like something that you're also adding in is this idea that times have changed. And I do think COVID has also exacerbated that in some really odd ways. We all, everybody knows now COVID time. And we all recognize that during that first two or three months right after COVID, what day is it? What time is it? Where am I? Because we had a very different sense of time because we were stuck in a single space with no change and time became irrelevant. And I think that culturally, some people have latched onto that and it's changed how they choose to live their lives. And so I, that's where I get stuck. Um, and I think my research, as much as I would love to say at some point, I want to present some great big broad, here is how time is understood. I don't think I could ever do that. It will never be truly generalizable because it's always going to be specific to the culture that it's coming from. And even if I went and studied in other cultures, you know, it's, I'm not going to understand it fully. And so yeah. I, I just think it's, it's my research is cool and it's interesting. And I love to talk to other people about it from wherever backgrounds they come from. 
Uh, but I, I, that's a big limitation I see in my research that I'm not fully sure, which is where I think the funds of durational knowledge might become more powerful. But That's very interesting, Amy, and I very much agree with it. I do have this tendency to believe, Chris, uh, as the only grandparent in the room, I would be happy to point out that uh, being a grandparent is a lot more fun than being a parent. Uh, and uh, Mercedes and Betty have heard me say this, if I'd known how much fun it was going to be, I would have just skipped the parent bit <laughs> altogether. Because you have this sense that, Chris, it's useful for you, for your children to go to bed. And as grandpa taking care of kids, it's useful for me to go to bed because grandpa wants to go to bed. You know, it's useful for me, not necessarily for them. And so uh, trying to, uh, Amy, and I think that's going to be changing, it's, I think. Uh, as young folks grow up with a little bit more, um, it's not going to be useful to them. You know, it, it's extraordinarily useful to GPS. You know, you have to have atomic clocks with precision to be able to do the math to chart where it is that you are. But uh, I, I am, I, I'm cheered by, and this will be my last comment, but I'm cheered by the fact that you showed a graph that I'm reaching an age, closing in on it where I find farting to be universally funny. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess I'm not old enough because I, I hadn't quite got to that point yet, but I see that it's in my future. So- uh, You're on that yeah, downhill. I'm on that down. I, I'm not on a slide, I'm on, I'm on a precipitous fall. So <laughs> I'm probably, and I'm also um, uh, ahead of, what's the word, precocious. I'm likely to find it funny before 90, um, just because, you know, I'm advanced. What can I say? <laughs> speaking of all that, uh, speaking of another piece of time, I have to close out Zoom by 12.59 uh, p.m. So um, I thank you all for your time as well and uh, look forward to speaking with more from the education department being a graduate of the education right. department here myself. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye.